Superb. Hello and welcome. It is kind of weird to be in front of actual human beings. I've done this quite a long time, but I mean, I've been stuck inside of my home office for a year and a half, and it's kind of weird to interact with people. My first thought was, am I wearing pants, which I am, by the way. Uh, I'm also uh, sorry to say that I have two enormous lights in my face. It's kind of doing the, the, um, the deer in headlights thing. So I have a bit of a hard time seeing you all. I'll do my best. And I will also try to be fairly behaved, which is kind of weird in itself, and staying inside of my, my kind of box here. I do some presentation skills training, and one of the things that I tell my students is never, ever stand behind a lectern. I've been told in no uncertain terms that I should be staying behind the lectern because this is the video pickup. So I will be here-ish. Anyways, welcome to Flying Blind. This is um, basically me distilling what I learned over a year and a half of doing something that I really didn't enjoy, which was teaching, speaking, training stuff online. So it started back in, well, 2020 was starting fantastically. I, I had done five um, sessions already in, in March, and I've been to Sweden, Norway, Finland, the UK. I was running all over the place. I had a long list of amazing things that I knew that I was going to be doing. And I also had started up a new kind of course that kind of works on flipped classroom style. So you basically give people all the information and then they have to work together to figure things out. Now, then the world ended. Overnight, nothing was going to happen. Everything just shut down. And here I was going, um, would, eh. so what do you do? Well, what do you do? The pandemic was a fact. Everything was shutting down. Nobody could go anywhere well, so what do you do? Well, we kind of re-rig and you think, let's do this online stuff. And I had done a few sessions online, uh, mostly for user groups and the likes, so smaller things. And I really didn't like it because I thought that speaking online and then doing stuff over Teams or, or Zoom or whatever, it kind of takes away the most important aspect of teaching, training, speaking, the whole nine yards. And that's the, the human connection. <laughs> Too bad. My love sucked, but I couldn't do anything about it. This was the new reality, and I was never one to, to adapt very well, but I had to. And I also had to think about something else. How do, how do I do this? Where can I look to to figure out how to actually do these things? And I decided to actually look at something that is kind of outside of the box, because I decided to go look at how do streamers do it? So the people that make a living of streaming content on YouTube or, or uh, Twitch or whatever. And that's pretty much how I decided to do it. So I took some, some ideas from there and I, I went from there. This session, as I said, is the, the net sum of everything that I've, I've figured out. I have done a lot of things wrong. Let's just say that. And I know of many ways that you can do something. So don't take this as the only way of doing it. This, this is just what I've come up with. So we're going to talk about the challenges with speaking online. It doesn't sound very hard. And one of the issues that I find with it is that it is so deceptively easy to do. It's easy to speak online. It is not easy to not suck when speaking online. Ask me how I know. We're also going to look at what I recommend for when it comes to technology, because this is kind of a tech game. It's not like golf. You need more stuff and more um, ex expensive stuff doing golf. But still, you definitely need some hardware. And some things are nice to have. Some things are absolutely need to have. And we're going to look at how speaking online actually differs from speaking like this. And it's a kind of a weird one. I've, I've done this session a few times, but this is the first time I've done it in person. So this is a session about speaking online that I am now doing in person. If that's not Inception, 
I don't know what is. So here's the thing. When you're a speaker or a trainer, you're wearing a pretty big hat. That's the, the hat of an expert, right? You need to figure out how to get your point across. Mm, that's a pretty big hat in and of itself. And the trick is, when you're doing this online, you're not wearing one hat. You're wearing four. Because you're going to need to wear the hats of producer, moderator, and teams expert, or Zoom, or insert whatever tool you're using. And um, I have the utmost respect for teams. I just need to get that out of the way. I'm going to bash teams a bit, but I really like it, honestly. So my goal today is to give you some tips, some ideas, how to up your online speaking game, regardless of what you're trying to do. If you're just trying to do a, a small 10 people event or a huge 6 million people event, I don't care. It doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, it's going to be the same kind of skills. My name is Alexander. I am from Sweden, which is not quite as cold as Norway today. Almost, but not quite. Um, and I, I did a, actually fly from, from my city to, to Schiphol in, in, in Holland and then back. So Schiphol, it was very, very, very windy and about 10 degrees. And then I come here, it's 12 degrees minus, so it's even colder. I'm a data platform MVP. Uh, which means that I'm one of seven uh, most valuable professionals when it comes to data stuff in, in Sweden. I work as a um, principal solutions architect, which is, by the way, the best title I've ever had because nobody knows what it is. And it's kind of easy to say. I, I, I used to say that I went all over the world to speak at conferences, and that's true. I used to. Then I was stuck in my home office for one and a half years. But basically, I make data matter because only data that matters can actually change anything. I'm a certified trainer. I do a lot of speaking all over the world. I've been almost everywhere that I can think of. I co-host a podcast called Needy in Tech. And yes, for you, uh, you in, in my age or older, that is the Doom game logo, which is probably the best game ever done. Just saying. And I have some stickers because everybody likes stickers. I've heard on, I actually have it on, on pretty good authority that a, um, a laptop with lots of stickers is a faster and more efficient laptop. Bet you didn't know that, huh? So, here it is. Um, this is a shot of me, the, the camera is actually sitting about here, of me flying a motor glider. A motor glider is what you get when you put a small aircraft and a glider in the hangar one night, and they like each other very, very much. That's what you get. It's, it's essentially a, um, an underpowered uh, single-engine airplane with way too long wings. It is terribly difficult to drive on, on the ground. I'm flying under what's known as VFR, or visual flight rules, which means that I keep my eyes peeled outside of the cockpit. Yes, I'm going to use the, my, my instruments to, um, to have a baseline, but most of the time I'm going to be looking outside, figuring out if someone is coming the other way, where am I going, what's that small city over there, all that stuff. I need to, um, to make sure that I, I have my eyes peeled because I never know what might come outside. And this is kind of what a session on stage is because I need to keep an eye out. I need to keep an eye out on my audience because I need to read my audience and I need to take feedback from the audience. If everybody, got a, everybody goes like this, I might have a bit of an issue. We're not there yet. You might be surprised how many speakers do the equivalent of just jump in the airplane and go. There's so many speakers that basically just wing it. That doesn't mean that they're bad speakers. I mean, there, there are so many people that can do that. I can't. I need to, to really train the, the heck out of anything I do. But... There, there is a reason why you do preparations. And VFR stuff, while well, it's not that much preparations, I do my walk around around the airplane before I take off, but otherwise I can kind of go to the airfield, jump in the airplane, make sure that everything's good, and take off and go somewhere. There is another very different way of flying. That's called IFR, or inf um, Instrument Flight Rules. This means that I can't see 
my wingtips. I, it's, it, I literally cannot see my wingtips. I might be just in, in white out. I can't see my wingtips, let alone anything else. There's, I, there, there could be a jumbo jet coming that way. I have no idea. This is where it is exceedingly important to do proper planning. I need to have the proper planning in. I need to have the proper skills in. And I need to do a lot of radio work in, with, with the air traffic control. What's even worse is, if you do look outside, your body is going to start making weird stuff to you. Because you might have a feeling that you're in a bank when you're not. This is very, very, very difficult to learn. It's doable, but it's very difficult to learn. It, it takes, again, a lot of practice and a lot of preparation. So, again, you're looking at your instruments. What happens outside doesn't matter. You are looking at your instruments, basically your six-pack, so your, your six primary instruments. And, in fact, when I was doing my glider license many, many years ago, um, not in this specific airplane, but in one of these, it was an ASK-21. I had to do a fam familiarization flight. That's a hard word, by the way, uh, on instruments. So my instructor taped over my gyro, and we got up, and he was in the back. Uh, we went into a cloud, and he said, my airplane, your controls. And he said, okay, we're going to be spending roughly 30 seconds in here. 30 seconds, because your, your mind's going to be properly scrambled by then, and then it's going to be your airplane and you're going to take us out of here. So 30 seconds went by and he said, okay, your aircraft, my aircraft. So what I did, I started a gentle bank to the left and boom, my altimeter just fell on its nose. Everything was starting to spin, speed was coming up when I realized, okay, something is definitely wrong. So what do you do to, in order to decrease your speed? Well, you, you pull on the stick to kind of bring the nose up. Yeah, not so much, because I was diving even faster, and my speed was going haywire, and I hear a, um, a laughter in the back. It goes, okay, my controls, your controls, and suddenly we break out from the cloud cover, because my very, very evil flight instructor had, as soon as we entered the cloud, started to slowly bank the airplane. I had no idea. I had absolutely no idea that he gave me an airplane that was banked almost 90 degrees to the left. So with I, what did I do? Well, I exacerbated the issue. I turned as almost inverted. And if we had not broken out uh, the cloud cover, if I would not have my instructor in the back, I would be not standing here because I'd be in a pile of dust. Okay, so why do I give you that story? Well, that's pretty much what speaking online can set you up for. You might be in way over your head, and you're not even know, aware of it. So let's start with the obvious. I can't see anyone. Well, I kind of can't see anyone today either, because again, I have two enormous lights in my face. So why is that a problem? Well, we need to take a step back and think about why are we here in the first place. And this is where I might differ a bit. I've, I've had a lot of conversations with other speakers, um, but the way I see it, I'm in teaching mode. Whenever I go on stage, whenever I do a session, I am in teaching mode. I'm trying to convey something, a concept, a specific solution, whatever, something to my audience, right? And that means that I need to keep track of three things, or at least three things. The first one is that I need to control the information. Well, I probably can do that because I wrote the darn script, right? The second one is I need to control information. Again. Um, or I should say the deliverer. Again, that's fairly easy if I know what I'm doing and Teams actually works. And here we have a bug in my presentation. I also need to control my audience. And that is not easy on the best of days. It's not easy when I'm in the same room as my audience. And it's a heck of a lot more difficult if I'm on the other side of the world. So... Here's the thing, a, a, a good speaker uses the audience kind of like an instrument. And I've been thinking about that, that um, way of putting it. it. It kind of sounds like I'm doing things to you. I'm doing unspeakable things to my audience. And that's not quite what I'm going for. But it's, it's a play. We work together. 
I say something, you react, I work off that reaction. That's how it works as a, a speaker. And I mean, I'm sure you've all been to a session where everything just clicks. The speaker seems relaxed, seems to know what they're talking about. The audience is excited, interested, everything is quiet, and everything is moving on. It can be done via video, but it is very, very, very hard. So, less talking, more action. How do we see if it's like 70 euros or something? Uh, but it's, it's decent. It's way, way, way better than anything you have on a laptop, I can say that. And this is pretty much everything you need. It's not everything you want, but it's everything you need. But I realized after 15 minutes that, yeah, nope, I'm not going to try this again. I was teaching a course on Azure infrastructure. I think most of the people fell asleep or logged off or went to do another career. It didn't work out. Okay. But I knew what was not working and I know or I knew what I could do better. Because by far, the most important thing, the most important piece of hardware you can have is a good microphone. Everything has a secondary. It doesn't matter if your camera sucks. Audio is the absolute number one thing. The thing is, good audio is kind of difficult in and of itself. What does it mean? Well, you need to have a good microphone. It doesn't mean that you need to have a microphone the size of this, but it means that you need to have a decent, good microphone. That works for everything. We also need to consider stuff like a mixer, if you have one of those. And I, I highly recommend you to do so, or get one of those. I'm going to come back to the details. Then we have the room. This is hard. I am lucky in a way that I, I, I have my own room in my apartment. And I'm going to come back to how much I've done to that room in order to fix audio because, or, or reverb. That's hard. And we also need to think about the proper technique for using a microphone. You'd be surprised how many ways that you can screw up sound with a microphone. Some people want to talk very close to the microphone. Some people have it over here and you struggle to hear anything. It's, it's technique. It's something that you can learn. And I highly recommend you to do so. Let's start with these simple parts. Well, that's going to be the technical aspects of a microphone. There are essentially three kinds of microphones. Those would be dynamic, condenser, and ribbon. And unless you're in the musical industry, you don't have to care about the, the, the ribbon stuff because it's very, very rare even in, in the recording industry. But dynamic and condenser are those things, or are the ones that we need to think about. I won't bore you to tears with the details of how they work, just be aware that they work very, very differently. And they pick up sound very, very differently. Especially ambient noise. Then we have the style of the microphone. And as you can see, there are a couple of ones. Uh, the one style that I'm wearing right now is one of my favorites. Um, it's kind of a boom mic. Um, th this one is very discreet. It also means that it's very, very expensive. Mine is not quite that expensive, but it it's the, the, the one in the left. Then we have the radio style microphone. They have their uses. I prefer not to use them because they're enormous and they're in my face. And I tend to put myself in the video frame when I do speaking and teaching. I use that for my podcast because it has fantastic sound. Then we have the, the lavalier mic. Those are really, really nice as well. Or we have the boom, um, yeah, the shotgun mics. Keep in mind though, it might seem like a good idea to put a shotgun mic inside of a small room. It isn't. You're going to have so much issues with a shotgun mic because it amplifies any sound waves bouncing around. So it might sound like a great idea, but it isn't. So don't go out and buy one of those before you do a lot of research. It's going to, it's going to be rather costly for you. All of these are good alternatives. You need to figure out what works for you and what you want to achieve. Speaking of the room, audio is hard. 
room reverb is very hard because sound bounces all over the place. This is a very difficult room, I should say. We have fairly hard floors. Um, I think these will do a good job of attenuating sound, but it's a difficult room. And if you think of a normal room in an apartment, especially if you have hardwood, oh boy, that's going to be a hard one. Hardwood and nothing on the, the walls, it's going to be an echo chamber. So what I had to do was very, very heavy drapes. I have a huge carpet. My cats love it. I need to make sure that I don't step on the cats because that makes a lot of interesting sounds on, on a recording. Um, and I also put up um, um, audio panels in, in the roof, uh, in, in the ceiling and on, on my walls. The thing is, not everybody can do that. A lot of my, my speaking colleagues, they might have a small, small apartment or they don't have a specific room for it. So this is, again, why I think you should do a lot of research when it comes to microphones. A dynamic microphone, as opposed to a condenser microphone, is probably a better choice. Because a dynamic microphone is much better at rejecting sound around it. A condenser microphone gives you a, strictly speaking, better sound if you're doing music, but a a, a dynamic microphone is probably the better choice if your room is not a perfect room. Right. Interfaces. There are a lot of interesting ways you can connect a microphone to a computer. The most obvious one being USB. And uh, it's a kind of a good idea, and there are some really good USB mics. No, the Blue Yeti is not one of those. But there are ways to connect stuff with, with USB. Uh, the MV7, uh, the Shure MV7, is a great alternative. But I would highly recommend you to go the XLR route. XLR is a three-pin connector that anybody who's ever been in the, the, the audio industry knows by heart. It gives you so much more options. And you probably want to connect this to some kind of, of box. In this case, there are three of them. Either the Motu, the Go XLR, or the Focusrite. Those, those are connection boxes, if you will. You put in a XLR microphone, and out of from the the audio interface, you have a USB USB um, cable, and that essentially gives you the, the decent audio. They have different kinds of features. At the end of the day, they do the same thing. They connect your XLR microphone to a USB um, port in your computer. But some of them have some things built in. I have run a Motu. I think that's a fantastic piece of kit. These days I run a Go XLR. Uh, again, the, the preamps or the, the amplifiers in, in it is a very good choice when it comes to driving uh, certain kinds of, uh, of microphones. What if I told you that the most important thing for good video is not the camera. No, it isn't. It's this. Lighting is absolute key. I've seen so many examples of people trying the most amazing camera with maybe a light bulb. I'm going to show you what, what happens if, if that is the case. I mean, if, if you were to buy a, a, an expensive DSLR, an expensive camera, and still have Poor, video, poor lighting, you're going to be looking at this. This is decent lighting. This is not decent lighting. Right? This is just the ambient uh, light in my room. This is what you get with real good lighting. It gets even worse if you were to throw in a background. This is just me on a black background. But if I were to... Um, I'm going to come back to, to the, the, um, the green screen stuff in a bit because it's going to change things a bit. When it comes to the cameras, that's a whole different story. Most people are going to start with a Logitech C920 or something, uh, some kind of webcam. There are, there are good webcams, there are bad webcams. But you're probably going to go somewhere to a more expensive camera, such as the Sony A-series. Those, those are really good. Just make sure that the... The camera outputs what's known as clean HDMI. Otherwise, you're going to have all the interesting things like your, your aperture setting and all that stuff in your video frame, and that is not nice. 
while we're on the subject of a camera, most people know that they need probably buy a decent camera, but don't skimp on the lens. I'd rather have a decent camera and a good lens than the other way around. And the better the lens, the, the shorter the um, field of, of uh, the, the depth of, of um, focus, for instance, is, is, uh, is something you're going to see. So back to this. This is an A5100, a Sony A5100, roughly 400 euros, give or take. The smile was extra. You can tweak a C920, a Logitech webcam, pretty darn good. This is a C920. It's not that much of a difference. This one, I, I, I had to crank um, the... Um, so some settings, for instance, the, the bright, uh, brightness is slightly higher, but it's not that much of a difference. But if we were to add a background to the whole thing, this is again the C920, uh, the, the, um, the A5100, and this is the C920. So you can get pretty decent results with a cheap-ish webcam, as long as your lighting is good enough. So, out we go and buy a decent camera, a nice lens. We put the whole thing together, realize how the heck do we connect them to the computer? Because before the pandemic, there was almost no high-end camera that you can put in, well, plug into a USB uh, port and have it behave as a webcam. Uh-uh. Nope, didn't work. So, you had to buy one of these. That's the Elgato um, CamLink, or... Well, in this case, in HD60. It essentially takes the HDMI from your camera and puts it into a USB. These days, because of the pandemic and because of people buying decent cameras for doing um, webcasts and, and the, the like, some producers, such as Canon, has added firmware to make their, their cameras behave as a webcam. But if we don't want to buy one of these expensive cameras, we are walking around with an amazing camera in our pocket. One of these. The cameras in these are absolutely fantastic. It, it definitely beats the one that I have in my computer. And it's probably going to beat most of the webcams as well. So why don't we use this? It's quite possible. Okay. So how do we make this whole thing work? So far, we've had a lot of big Lego pieces. But how do we make everything work? That's harder than it sounds. Because I'm wearing my, my producer hat as well. And the producer is going to do stuff like changing angles, doing cut scenes, and um, generally keeping things interesting, right? Everything that, that is hard to do when you're speaking online as it is. Well, there are a couple of tools. Anybody heard of vMix? Anybody heard of OBS? Um, I run OBS myself, Open Broadcast Studio, because it's cheap, as in free. Uh, vMix is pretty expensive, but OBS does just about everything that I needed to do. And at the end of the day, what I need to do is combine scenes uh, I, I need to build scenes by combining video sources and audio sources and putting them into a, an entire scene. And this is then being output to the virtual camera. So Teams, for instance, will be highly confused because instead of my mug, I'm going to be outputting something like this. I might be outputting a window. I might be outputting something else. And the trick is to not work with this as if it was a camera. What do I mean with that? Well, think about if you need to do a, a course or if you do a, a session or whatever. You might need to have a demo inside of, of um, let's go with the Azure portal. That's going to be in one window. You're going to need your 
speaking notes inside of PowerPoint, you're going to need a whiteboard. And all this is a bit of a mess to keep track of, all tabbing and stuff like that. And if you need to, instead of, of sharing your whiteboard, you need to share your your um, PowerPoint or whatever, you need to be able to quickly change between these. That's where OBS comes into play. So instead of me scrambling to figure out where the share button is on Teams this day, because it has been moved around, then I can just switch my scenes in OBS. And again, this is being output to the camera. So OBS, or, or to, so Teams thinks that, well, instead of my, my face, it's going to see all these other things. There's a problem with that. Anybody who's ever tried to do that is going to run into two issues. One is, since Teams doesn't understand that I am sharing anything, it's not going to be putting me inside of a full screen. And the other part is kind of a dirty secret when it comes to Zoom and, and Teams and all those things. The video stream is not very highly prioritized. Meaning that the first thing that's going to go and be um, having decreased um, quality is the video stream. Which kind of is an issue if you're trying to sh share a PowerPoint through the video screen. There is a way around that. I'll give you that in a second. So how do you switch between these scenes? Well, there is a couple of ways. You can use your mouse. It's going to be awkward. You can use your phone. Less awkward. Or you can buy more stuff. Everybody likes stuff. This is a Stream Deck. A Stream Deck is essentially just an overpriced keyboard that you can put icons on. But this I can bind, so whenever I press a button, there are things happening inside of OBS. There's another way, and I'm the way that I prefer to do it, and that is using a piece of software written by Scott Hanselman that essentially connects to OBS and to... Um, to PowerPoint, so I can have a tag in my PowerPoint um, speaker notes, and that's going to give the uh, the signal to the Stream Deck to change my scenes. Really, really cool. I said something about a green screen. The green screen is pretty much the thing that can tie the whole thing together, because with a green screen such as this, I can put myself inside of a presentation. And that, I think, is one of the huge advantages of, of using a green screen. Because what's going to happen? Otherwise, you're going to be in well, roughly this size to the left or to the right of your, your presentation. Nobody's going to be looking at you. And in my view, I am the presentation. This is just support. The, pre the, the, uh, the PowerPoint is just support. I am the presentation. And as soon as we go online, I am nothing, and the presentation is the only thing that matters. So by inserting myself into the presentation, that's a whole different ballgame. So how do we do this? Well, let's just say that before I managed to figure this out, there was a lot of screaming. And as I said, since the video sharing over uh, my, my camera is the the one that gets prioritized the lowest. What I do is that I have three screens. I have my main screen and I have two small screens. And then I'm going to be putting my output window onto one of the screens. And then I'm going to share that screen to Teams as if I was sharing my, my PowerPoint. And suddenly I can not only have my face, but I can also have anything that I, I share, such as my presentation and myself in the corner. Voila. That is shared, i.e. Teams will not be stomping my um, quality. That's kind of neat. When it comes to Teams, I found that in the beginning a lot of people were running... Uh, what was the... It's not a normal meeting. It was... Um, kind of a webinar style, where nobody can speak. It's just the, the, uh, the host that can speak. We started doing that, and we quickly stopped doing that because there was no interaction at all. So we went to a normal Teams meeting instead. Yes, you're going to have some potential issues with people that just can't, for the life of them, figure out where the mute button is. 
But yeah, um, for the most part, I find that a normal Teams meeting or a Zoom meeting is the way to go. Are we going to have any technical challenges? Oh boy, yes we are. For starters, we're going to have a lot of um, hats to wear. Producer, tech, you're going to need someone to, to figure out teams, the chat, all that stuff. How do we interact with people in teams? Well, there are a couple of ways. Either they just unmute and scream the question, which is kind of cute, uh, might be a bit off-putting, or you can use the, the raised hands. The problem is I can't see the raised hand. If I have my presentation view on my main screen, and I have the two different screens, and one of them is, is shared through Teams, I can't see it. That's where it is so much worth to have a moderator that can keep track of, of that stuff. So just, just be aware. I've had Teams failing. I've had audio video issues. I've had almost any kind of technical issue. And yes, I was about to say this doesn't leave the room, but I just realized that it's actually recorded. I've managed to have an update on Windows whenever I, when I was speaking. Everybody has. It's okay. No, I'm an idiot. Yeah, it was a bit of an, idiot, um, bit of a, uh, an issue. But we've also kind of learned a few key phrases, such as, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Is he wearing pants? Those, those are the kind of questions that we've learned over the, the, uh, the course of this pandemic. And here's the thing. If I were speaking here right now and that thing would die, what do I do? Well, I reach into my bag and I pull out another one. How do you sort that if your internet goes down at home? You're up sheet quick without a paddle. There are so many more potential issues when speaking from home. Don't even try to troubleshoot them because you can't. You will not be able to sort that as you're standing there trying to just make things happen. Have a fallback plan and make sure that it actually works. Try it out before the shit does hit the fan. Um, when it comes to handling people, most of the time when you're, you're speaking in a room like this, you don't have to tell people to be quiet or to uh, go on mute. Um, and very, very seldom when you're speaking in a room in person, you will face someone playing porn very loudly. That is a potential issue when you're speaking online during a, a user group. That was different, I'll say that. I don't think I've ever been that fast at muting someone, but yeah. So, again, always have a fallback plan. What kind of fallback plan would you have for your internet connection going down? Well, back to this one, 4G. It's surprisingly efficient. It, it might actually work, and it's probably going to save your bacon that day. Okay. So, always have a fallback plan. Make sure it works. Test it out. A fallback plan that you haven't tested is about as useful as a smoke alarm with a snooze button. It doesn't mean anything. Spend your money wisely. I love buying hardware, but you might not necessarily need to buy everything that I did. I have a stack of stuff that I don't use anymore. So use your money wisely. Do some research. And only use tech that you're comfortable with. It doesn't matter if it's the coolest thing ever. If you can't use it, it's useless. So I'd much rather see you buy the, the old boring stuff that we know works than the cool stuff that might work. Because this is not supposed to be exciting. Not in that way. So, speaking online then. What changes? Well, this is where it becomes interesting. Because, again, I, I do a lot of uh, presentation skills training, and I've only done it for presentations in, in, in person. So, have you ever gone into a, a room where you just felt walking in that mm, something is off? 
Something is not entirely right. People are not entirely happy. It's a difficult place to start from as a speaker. What is the most important thing that a speaker has? Two of these. Use your ears as a speaker. You must listen to your audience. You must listen with your eyes. You must listen with your mind. Because you can tell so much from an audience. I can tell you're all so happy. You're, you're bursting at... No, not so much. Well, you're here. I'll, I'll take that. The thing is, how do you do that over teams? You don't. You are essentially deaf as a doornail. You don't have any way of gauging anything with your audience. Well, that basically means that you're flying blind. So, what do you need to change or what do you need to think about? Well, here I can meet your eyes. That's easy. How do you meet someone's eyes over teams? Well, you stare into the camera. And it's a very, very weird feeling, especially if you have a slave display that shows yourself. So you're basically speaking to yourself. Um, there, there's, um, there's a number of psychiatric disorders that is creepingly close to speaking online. You need to think about what's known as mirroring. I can mirror you. I cannot mirror someone on the other side of teams. So I need to basically run things as if there was nobody looking. That means, again, I need to practice. I need to think about everything I do, how I walk, how I stand, how I behave. How everything I do needs to be figured out beforehand. How do we handle stuff like um, questions? Well, here I can throw out a question, and I'm probably going to get an answer. Don't do that over teams. Because first people need to figure out, oh, he's not asking a rhetorical question. Oh, I want in on this. And then we need to figure out how to be unmute, and then suddenly 20 people unmute at the same time, and calamity ensues. Yeah, doesn't work that way. Use quizzing software, such as Kahoot or, or Socrative, stuff like that. That works much better in that kind of situation. And um, another thing, when was the last time you saw a speaker sitting on stage? It doesn't happen very often, does it? But how many times do you think speakers on online stuff sits down? Well, most of the time, because a surprising number of people are actually using normal desks. I've been running a standing desk for ooh, 15 years. And that's because my back is not the greatest. I preferred standing. And for me, it's much easier to do a session, even if I'm on, on, on a, a webcam, just standing up, much preferred to, to sitting down. So don't skimp on ergonomics. I've done 30-ish sessions online the last year alone. I would have had a lot of pain if I had to sit down and work with my computer all day long. So think, think about ergonomics, and not, not very many people do. So we've already talked about ways of, of handling audience and engaging audience interactivity. Kahoot, uh, Socrative, works very well. If you have a moderator that can keep track of the, um, the chat, that's perfect because you're going to get more information that way. Keep in mind that the raised hands might be very, very difficult for the speaker to see. And you might want to instigate some, some rules, if you will, as you start and say, okay, you're more than uh, welcome to unmute and ask questions if you want, but just be aware of that. There's a lot of the interesting things, like working internet. I kind of enjoy working internet. I am fortunate to have fiber internet in my apartment. Not everybody does. So I have a friend of mine who lives literally in a cabin in the forest. And on a good day, he has 3G. On a bad day, he doesn't. So he has a few issues trying to do these things. He needs to go into his, his office, essentially. 
Another thing that might not come into play or won't come into play in person, time zones. I can't tell you the number of times where we've had speakers in another time zone mistake the time zone the event is in. It sounds kind of weird. I mean, how do you mess that up? It's so easy to do over the internet. Um, Finland is one hour ahead. The UK is one hour behind. When you have a Finnish speaker at a UK event or vice versa, it gets messy very, very quickly. That doesn't happen when you're on site. And then we have a third issue. And that is actually burnout. Something happened around Christmas time last year. Um, just about every other speaker that I, I know, and there's a lot of us, we had to transition to doing stuff over Teams or, or Zoom, whatever. And what happened was there were so many events cropping up because everybody under cat realized, oh, I can do an event. It's much easier to do an online event than to whip up an event venue like this. So the number of online events skyrocketed. I literally had a session at an event roughly every week. That means that you get to do the same session way more often than you might do it in person. And this, surprisingly enough, led to some pretty severe burnout. There were a lot of speakers that woke up one day and said, nope, I am not doing this anymore. This is not, anymore. This is not fun anymore. So be aware of that. And that is also something that is very rare in person, but it does happen online. So what are the takeaways that we can have here? Well, if you can have help, if you can have someone keeping track of your, your chat window, do so. This is not a one-man show. The more people that you can have on to make the whole thing more interactive, do it. It will pay for itself. Always practice delivery. Do not go on stage and wing it. I'm not saying you can't. I'm saying you shouldn't. Because again, you can't read your audience. You don't have any clues. You don't have anything. So you need to have your timing, your delivery, everything down pat. And also, tailor your delivery to the specific environment. Teams doesn't behave the same way as Zoom does. There are other esoteric pieces of software that I had no idea existed and I hope never to touch again, but they behave slightly differently. When it comes to how they um, encode the video stream, for instance, some do more um, compression than others. That you need to be aware of so you can tweak your, your sizes and things like that. So again, you need to be prepared. You need to do so much more legwork before you just stand up and do the, the uh, presentation. So in summary, just like flying on instruments, the technology gives you the framework to be able to do something, but it won't do it for you. You can have the best camera, you can have the best audio, you can have the best lighting, it doesn't matter if you can't put the whole thing together and use it. So that's key. As I've been on multiple times, preparation. Prepare, prepare, prepare. When you do an instrument flight, if you want to go from point A to point B, the number of the, the, the amount of paperwork you need to sign up or fill in, it's, it's, it's staggering. It's the same thing here. Make sure that you prepare. And it's not the same. Don't act like it is. It's not unlike people go, well, the cloud is just like somebody else's data center. No, it isn't. That's just a small part of it. Just the same thing as speaking online is not the same as going up in front of an audience. No. The speaking part might be, but everything else isn't. And that needs to be in, in people's minds. So, my goal was to give you some thoughts and tips for basically how to figure out how to wear multiple hats. That's what you need to do at the end of the day. 
and upping your, your speaking game with this new knowledge. You are now prepared to call yourself an uh, online speaking unicorn. No, probably not, but it's something. It's different. I've said that before. It's going to be different. And I've been through a lot in this hour, um, and I've not even dove into any of the, the technical details. Um, I have some of this on my, my blog, needeepintech.com. Um, but I will be putting out more blog posts as I, I, um, I figure out how to write a blog. The world basically, as we know, it ended in March 2020. I'm pretty sure that it will write itself. I don't know when. I was hoping uh, that we would not find ourselves in the situation that we are in now with, with Omicron, but it is what it is. Nobody will know what shape the world is when it comes back on its feet. But every trainer that I know and every speaker that I know has had to learn to fly on instruments, if you will, in, in one shape or form. If COVID magically goes away, we're still going to be doing a lot of online stuff. Because if, if there is nothing that COVID has shown us, then, then that's the fact that Everything that we couldn't do or thought we couldn't do, well, it turns out we can. We can do so much through Teams and through Zoom. There's a difference between can and should, but we can. So we can just put the whole thing we can't to bed. And it's not easy, but it can be done. As I've said, practice, practice, practice. And just like flying on a clear day is, is fantastic, Going out on an instrument flight is, is equally fun and rewarding. You have some new skills. Find what works for you. Go practice and uh, have a safe flight. My name is Alexander, and I thank you so much for your time. Are there any questions? Apart from when can we have food? Yes, sir. That's a great question. So the question is, do I have to have a physical green screen or can I have software? Well, yes, you can have software. It does come with a few limitations. It's not going to be as good uh, as, as a green screen when it comes to separating you from the background. And it will use quite a lot of CPU power, um, is, is my experience. So I would recommend you to go for a green screen.